a little bit technical here. Oh, and yes, we are recording this evening. Um, this means so we can make it available on our on our on the DHHL uh, project site. Um, sorry, one more minute here. That's not what I wanted. Excuse me. Sorry. Okay. I'm gonna, uh, oh, wait. Let's try this again. Oh, no. There we go. Okay. So, Mahalo. So, beneficiary meeting number three for the Wallapui Puliana Homestead Project. I know many of you have been with us, um, whether in past virtual meetings or beneficiary meetings, community meetings. We were last on island. This is this is almost December, about a month or so ago, or actually more than a month ago, doing our community meeting where we provided some updates. Um, tonight we have we have quite a bit of information to cover as we are actually are at the point, as I think we indicated uh, to many folks that we were hoping at this point to actually have a initial initial idea of what uh, the lot settlement layout could be, would be based upon uh, many factors uh, we've been analyzing, researching, and, and actually, you know, putting forth in the uh, consideration of this plan. So tonight, yeah, we'll, you know, again, let's kind of give a brief overview. If this may, you know, the, the invitation went out to to many of you on the waiting list for an agricultural homestead. Um, I feel many of you may have seen parts of this presentation before, but there could be some of you, and I'm trying to quickly scan names here, that this is your first time, and so we want to be sure everyone has access to the same information. So some of the initial slides might be repetitive for those of you who've been to all of our meetings. And then about halfway through the slide um, is when we get into the new material, which actually will discuss what we believe is the settlement uh, layout and, and some of the thinking behind it and some of the challenges. And then we'll get into some you know, Q&A. We actually will also um, do a couple of Zoom polls in between our presentation to kind of keep you know, everyone interested and engaged. And of course, at the end, we'll We'll definitely open it up for some um, for, for some Q and A, some questions back and forth. Again, appreciate everyone's indulgence uh, this evening to to sit tight here, and we'll try to get through some of this initial information, um, you know, in in a way that's efficient, but also you know everyone is is comfortable with what we're sharing. So again, the purpose of tonight's meeting is really for us to receive your feedback on what we're going to be showing as the lot layout. Towards the Kuliana Homesteading Project, we will be doing some polling, like I mentioned. And at the end of the day, what we're hoping is that the feedback we get tonight um, will then inform us to then go ahead towards the preparation of the draft Kuliana Homestead Settlement Plan. And again, I'll I'll take a moment to explain what all of those things are, the document, and how it all works. Again, for many of us, you know, we've lived in this world uh, in virtual for the last couple of years. So I think most of us are sort of ma. Uh, to Zoom and how we participate. But again, we're gonna ask that, uh, you know, you, if you have a question, you feel free to utilize the chat box and or you can raise your hand. Um, there's many of us actually from Group 70 and DHHL tonight. I guess I guess I should have started with that, I apologize. So again, I'm Kabika McKay. Uh, I'm a planner, a consultant with Group 70, who's the consultant um, working on behalf of DHHL. And, um, you know, we are the ones who've been working on this plan. I will ask um, as a kind, kind consideration if, um, we don't ask you to come off of mute, to stay on mute, because I know many of us are coming from different places and sometimes that feedback can um, cause a distraction for those trying to listen to me. So again, well, we, will, we will get to all the questions tonight. We, we're planning to be here for the length of time and we can stay afterwards if there's more questions. But again, we just appreciate the, um, the consideration. So um, time for a Zoom poll. So again, uh, I guess P, you will be helping us with this. and. Um, what we all want to do is sort of pulse who's in the in the virtual room this evening, and um, you know ask you for this round three questions. And so I do apologize for some for those of you who might um, be on the telephone. I don't think you can participate, but we also can provide these questions um, on the link. And for those who want to participate, we can or or yeah, we can figure out how to gather that information. So this first question. Actually, there's a, there's a series of questions here. There's actually three questions in a row if you look on the screen here. The first one is, are you an applicant, Messi, both, or other? And, and you have a single choice. And again, can just, uh, the polling screen should be popping up if you're on your computer. And then we're just polling to where are you from? Uh, from Walapu'e, Mana'e, Molokai proper, or someplace else? 
And for this evening, what topics would you like to learn more about and select all that apply? Okay, we see, I see some folks um, already chiming in here and looks like we have about 20 folks online. Um, I know we sent an invitation out to a couple of, or several hundred individuals, but again, we'll make this information available. We can gather information in other ways too. Um, hi, Kavika. We I have yes. just myself. Um, how are we able to do pool more than once? Or should I put down the other person's what they want to say for one, two, three on in a chat? Yeah, and that that directly to yeah. you. I think that would be the best. So yeah, thank you, course. So if you're if you're in a situation you're in a hale with multiple people attending this meeting. <laughs> Um, yeah, we only can take one response on the poll, but yeah, feel free to, to add yourself in the chat and then we'll go ahead and, um, you know, compile that information at the end. And I'm going to ask my fellow Group 70 members, uh, my, my screen here in presentation is a little bit small, so if you've seen folks with a hand raise or whatnot, just help, help me keep track of uh, questions in, in our audience this evening. So, um, Looks like we have about six respondents thus far, and it looks like um, yeah, two of the six are applicants. Uh, one is both, and then looks like four of the seven, or oh, we have seven participants, are other. And it looks like we have folks from one representative, two representatives from Wallapue. Okay, there's more information coming in in live, live time. Mana'e, about four of us, Moloka'i, proper, other, two, and then Looks like there's a there's an interesting range of um, folks who want to talk about different kinds of issues, multiple slope and erosion. Looks like subsistence ag is is on the top of people's list, along with water availability. And again, we'll speak to some of that as it relates to the project, archaeology, IWS, some of the community use spaces, access for hunting and gathering, and then overall community um, mm -hmm. impacts. So I'll keep this open for uh, our PE. Maybe we can keep this open for one more minute just to make sure people have had a chance to kind of settle in. And this is really to also get you folks comfortable. I know not, not all of us jump on Zoom all the time or participate in these polls. So we actually will have two more rounds of polling. So again, I appreciate everyone being here. And then uh, this information on the poll results will also be shared out on, on the website. And this is just for us to get to understand who's with us this evening. Where are you from? You know, who do you sort of represent in terms of, of yourself and the Han Ohana or community you come from? And what is of interest for you that we want to be sure we can, we can speak to tonight? Okay, so P, I guess maybe go ahead. We can end the poll at this time. Mahalo. Just to show you the quick results. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the final results here, yeah. So about four out of 10 are applicants, five are other, one is both. We have representation again from Mana'e, two from Walapu'e, one from Molokai, two from other. And again, the range of issues, water availability seems to be the top issue or, or topic for conversation, uh, along with subsistence ag specifically, and then sort of split with slope and erosion, archeological sites, IWS community use spaces with one vote and then the access and community impacts um, being sort of, you know, all equal. So we'll go ahead and, and I guess I can end that, that poll. Okay, so this time I, I may have failed to introduce the fact that with us from DHE Cho, we have Mr. Andrew Choi, uh, who is the planning manager for DHE Cho, as well as uh, Gigi Kyrell, who's the project, uh, one is the planning manager, excuse me, one of the project manager for DHHL for the project. So Andrew, if I can turn the time over to you, please. Um, mahalo, Kavika. Um, mahalo, everyone, for joining us this evening. Um, you know, this this slide is really just to talk about um, the Ohio Homes Commission Act and what why we are here, the department is here. Um, you know, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands carries out um, Prince Kalaniano Oe, um vision of rehabilitating Native Hawaiians by returning them to the land. Um, as you folks probably know, you know, the act was established um, almost 100 years ago. Um, it was established by the US Congress. Um, it established and identified lands 
for DHHL uh, to return native Hawaiians to. Um, as you know, also know that we have a uh, very long uh, wait list of folks waiting to get on the land um, that was uh, promised under the act. And one of the programs the department has created uh, to settle beneficiaries on the land more quickly is the Kuleana Homestead Program. And um, in the next couple of slides, um, we'll go over what that program is. So I'll jump in then. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so we're really operation, operationalizing ourselves on the portion of the administrative rules for DHHL under um, HER 10.3-30. And again, I'll allow you to recall this slide, but this is what sort of guides and governs the work that we're doing, what we're responsible for trying to accomplish in this, in this task, the kinds of resources and considerations for certain uses. And so just to quickly highlight that the settlement plan, um, you know, as prescribed here, is, is something that needs to be worked together with interested applicants so individuals like yourself and others who have participated in the, in the, in the past year or so uh, to develop a plan for the settlement and development of a designated track to be approved by the Hawaiian Homes Commission. And that's a plan, which is, again, something, it's a document that will kind of summarize all of the effort we've done to date and what we're sharing tonight needs to describe the location and description of the track, the size and number of lots, if there's other considerations for like a community use, community center, other common areas, are there ideas on the table, you know, um, for sort of community managed areas and opportunities, you know, in this language, econo economic development or things that go beyond just like the provision of a lot, but the, how to build community and fortify community with opportunities. And then, um, you know, what has been a lot of our time to date, as many of you know, is going through the uh, process to identify and then come up with strategies and and um, action towards the protection excuse, protection and preservation of significant um, historical archaeological and biological sites so that's that's the track that we're on and we're trying to accomplish um this slide is just to kind of maybe take a step back to do two things one <clears throat> as we all know for those of us that have been excuse me, that have been taught or, or schooled with the sense of kuleana, we understand it to be both privilege, responsibility, but also when we put the ho'o right to it, the, the, the active closet, it's a sense of giving right of possession, but the right to pass on responsibility. And again, I think going back to what Andrew said in, in, the, in the slide before, that that was the intention, that we believe, of the Hawaiian Homes Commission and to provide that ability uh, to re-engage Kanaka to Aina, and that this process, this planning process is a means to do that through, through the particular rules. So again, coming back to the rules, what is the specifics of the program? Again, to highlight that the Puleana Homestead is a specific program described in the rules. It has no relationship. You know, some of us might be ma'a to like talking about Kuleana from the 1850 Kuleana Act. That's separate and distinct from what we're talking about. Right? So Kuleana Homestead leases are Something that, are, that, that is an opportunity specifically for unimproved and available Hawaiian homelands. And we can talk about that a little bit more. And that these available homelands can be selected for this kind of program or for this program by the commission, primarily driven because to quote unquote do a traditional development, if you will, would be too excessive in cost uh, for these tracks due to certain factors, primarily the characteristics of the land, you know. Um, high slope, access limited, other factors, or the distance from utilities. So again, this was an opportunity um, that comes through this. And, and when you compare it to say the conventional leasing program to Kuleana leasing, there's a couple of things we try to keep in mind. One, we, we feel that it's, um, it's an opportunity for fast tracking, right? Uh, no need to necessarily qualify financially. You as an individual become part of a much larger community that becomes the Kuleana homestead, and you can go at your own pace. Again, we're talking about agricultural homesteads uh, this evening, which primarily focus on obviously the agricultural component, but there is conditions therein with ag leases to actually also build a home. And so, you know, it does, 
it doesn't mean necessarily we actually have to build all the homes at the same time and that people can actually kind of work at their own pace. Compared to the conventional, right, which is more like a prolonged process where we're looking at full site design, construction time, and there is, you know, more emphasis that the HHL puts in the infrastructure. We'll talk about that again, just to remind folks as to what, uh, what are the responsibilities of the, of the department. And you know, again, it's about looking towards more building community and capability or capacity and, and looking for opportunities to stewardship. So again, the responsibilities of the department relative to the rules is to determine, well, one, the Hawaiian Homes Commission determines which wait list to use to make these awards. And the department therein is required to do two things primarily. One is to provide the meets and bounds description of the lots, which, which will occur through this settlement plan, and then actually provide the unpaved right away to the awarded lots. Um, that's the primary responsibility as defined by the administrative rules. Now, that being said, we have had conversations with many of you over the last few months as to, okay, that's what the rules say, but what about these other factors? And I know we, we those conversations will continue to be ongoing probably this evening and throughout uh, the process here as we get through the settlement plan. So again, just to highlight for the lessees, uh, it's for those who really wish immediate access to the land and are willing to sort of live on the Aina and accept the, the Aina sort of an as is unimproved lot condition. And again, there's only a requirement to provide that right away to access the site. Now, that being said, that's not all the lessee must, must um, take on as Kuleana. They must also participate as an active member in the Homestead Association that would come about as part of the awarding process. And that, that hui of individuals will. Uh, develop and comply with the rules and agreements that will set the tone of what this community will abide by, what are its priorities, how do folks work together. And that, again, all of those that will participate in the program must also lend themselves to the maintenance of caring for the right of way to the Kuliana track, not, not just to your own track, but to the lots and the other key community areas. So that's process, um, again, I'm gonna take a few moments to just go over the project itself, where we are. And again, I've said this a couple of times that we've been engaging this uh, really since October of last year. So just over a year where we had our first beneficiary meeting. Much of this was still online due to some of the COVID conditions. And really, I think our first um, opportunity for community meeting was back in October of this year. So, you know, as you can see, we've engaged in, in several different um, conversations. We've engaged in our, our studies, uh, we've engaged in some of our preliminary analysis and the purpose of tonight is to share sort of the output of, of, of that. One of the, so I want to cut, cut, I want to touch on a couple of quick things. One is that from what we've heard thus far, and again, we'll seek to validate that this evening is um, our means with beneficiaries specifically, one that many of our participants as beneficiaries do have a polina to this aina, again, whether it's specifically to Walapu'e, to Mana'e, to Moloka'e, that many of the beneficiaries um, have that sense of connection already to this place. Um, and many of you feel that the settlement should focus on, on a couple of things and saw that again highlighted tonight about the securing of water, preservation of sites, improving opportunities for safety and access to, from, and through the site. And we also heard like preliminarily, the majority of beneficiaries think maybe that a one acre lot um, could be too small and we can talk about that. And that beneficiaries prefer individual lots and may also prefer backyard subsistence agricultural opportunities. We've also heard that some of the concerns are, are everything from slope and erosion, again, the access impacts the wider community, the wellhead protection, how do we perpetuate place names, what is that relationship of the association with the department. And, you know, we've had some initial dialogue like, well, if Walapoe, for whatever reason, is not deemed to be suitable or feasible. Is there an alternative location that the department can look towards in terms of doing this program um, in another in another way? Um, and, and then specifically to cultural resources, uh, cultural perspectives on the Alahele, to to Fahikanu, to Ilina, to Ivi Kupuna, and the land commission awards themselves. And also, just to contrast, and really there's not a lot in the contrast when we had community meetings, there's really quite a similarity. You know, again, beneficiaries are, are those on the wait list or those who have a lot. 
and to a, the broader community that we're seeking to just participate on East Molokai, you know, we've kind of hearing the same things, you know, and the nuances is about, you know, requesting that if there's opportunities for awarding on, on these lands, it should be Molokai families first. Again, that, that uh, introduces questions. Again, you know, the department can probably speak to some of that in terms of process. And then there's other things like considering, you know, certain space um, in this area for a resilience hub, uh, site safety, addressing some fire hazards, and again, some of the similar issues of erosion, access, protection of cultural sites, water issues, um, and so forth. So I guess what I really want to say here, you know, before we didn't go into like the, the technical details is that I, I believe as a team, we really took all of these considerations of Mana'o to, to heart, to, to Na'au really, and we further analyzed and studied and, you know, we would, we would talk to each other, okay, well, remember that person said this and what about this and are we addressing this issue? And so what, we, what we're presenting tonight is what we feel is our best foot forward, our best opportunity um, of where we think this project could be successful. And again, we, we're hoping through this dialogue this evening, we, we can uh, get some feedback. So if you attended the community meeting, um, we spent a lot of time kind of focusing on the analysis, especially when we got to the cultural and archeological resources. I, I'm not gonna go through that same lengthy presentation, but for those who may not have attended or as a careful reminder, what we first started to do again, is how we build our information base was one, we want to get good data. And data for us began with aerial imagery, high resolution, uh, because of the vast acreage that we're talking about here and what we were looking at initially, it's really hard to ground truth and cover that much acreage. So again, doing a flyover provided some high resolution imaging that allowed us to kind of take a quick pass um, on terrain, erosion, vegetation cover, and other sort of anomalies that would appear in, in the, the mapping. And then as we conducted some of these studies, again, the, long, the longest study, which required, I believe, three field, um, field visits was the archeological study. But in sum, we looked at primarily about 15 categories. Now again, could we have looked at more than 15? Yes, but we thought these 15 um, kind of highlighted one, what we heard is, hey, these are the things you need to be paying attention to, DHHL and, and Group 70, and, and here's why they're important. And so as we started to piece together our analysis, what we did was one, assign a rating system for each of those criteria, um, 10 being quote unquote lower sensitivity, one being high sensitivity, sensitivity primarily to the resource. So, um, and, and in that category was given a certain percentage. Again, I won't go into those, those details unless there's questions about it, but I wanna do focus on the, the two criteria that we gave the highest ratings to. So the first is, um, you know, slope and erosion. So as we know, the historical de uh, denudement of the forest through cattle grazing, the, the impacts of goats and deer, um, the lack of, or, or I guess the discontinuing of certain agricultural practices, because we do know from the archeological record that there was ar ar uh, agricultural practices on the site that led to erosion, have impacted both land and water quality, not just here on the property, but also down, mm -hmm. down slope to the shoreline, to the fish pond. Um, there is documentation that during heavy rains, soil continues to erode from the land in, in its as-is condition and has an impact. So one of the things we were trying to address and we, we have some suggestions on ideas is how to address that. Um, elevation here, again, preaching to the choir here, that it's super, super steep in some areas. The majority of the site is you know, in this range of 11 to 20% slope. We do have three major gulches through the area. And so from a, from a design perspective, you know, something that's a higher slope is really, not to say you couldn't do anything, but it becomes cost prohibitive, um, becomes this much more expensive to try and put a road on something super steep. So we try to look for the sweet spot that we call um, more to the zero to 15% slope. We thought that's the areas that are best, um, the best opportunities and anything above that really starts to become prohibitive. And what you're seeing here again, this really quickly on this map and then I turn my head here to the screen is, you know, the red is, anything above 25%. So there's a lot of red, but in between there's some pockets that we started to identify that, okay, might be tough, but we can see some areas where we see little pockets of the zero to 10, 10 to 15%. And that's where we kind of honed in our focus. 
The second thing we looked at, which again, I think most of us, if you've been a participant, <laughs> is the archaeology. Um, again, this is just a reminder that um, I think at present we identified 98 sites composed of, um, I can't remember the number of features, but it's in the hundreds of features. And so this set the tone of what this Aina is or was. And, and that study, um, we just received a draft in house, but um, it ranged from everything from uh, habitation sites to what could be plausible agricultural terraces that were used traditionally. Um, and, and anyway, so we, we are reviewing that report and refining some of our assumptions. For purposes of, of this exercise, we said, okay, well, if something was identified and if, if we're trying to set sort of a couple around the area, we went from a 30, 50 to 100 foot buffer, uh, meaning that anything above or outside of 100 feet would be deemed, I won't say open and free, but would be cautiously evaluated for what could be done outside of that buffer area. So 100 feet was something we kind of set. Anything less than that, we felt became too sensitive of an issue. So we basically put more constraints on ourselves really um, to do that. This is just a reminder of, you know, the pedestrian survey tracks that were conducted by Honor Consulting and then again showing the, the map. So all that being said, when we combine the two, we set the slope at 10% of, so if you, if you take the, sort of the, the created equation, right, of influence. So uh, everything has to add up to 100%. So we set slope to 10% or one-tenth of that, and we set the archaeology to 35%. And all those other categories, which um, you know, I highlighted there, uh, we're set to 5%. And this is the results here. Uh, this is a map that shows, you know, when we combine all those factors, what does it look like? And again, for purposes of the conversation, because um, we are going to get into the initial lot layout in the very next slide, and I'm going to turn the time over to Ryan, which is a cue for Ryan to, to get Makakao, is basically the darker greens to light green is what we call potentially suitable for homesteading or for some other activity community use, and that anything that's dark red to the sort of the dark red here to maybe these orange tan hues are things we just need to, be, to need to be a little bit maka'ala about or be cautious and conservative in what we think we can do here. It doesn't mean we can't do anything, and I'm not suggesting we do quote-unquote homesteads, but are there opportunities, for example, to do uh, aina-based restoration of the forest or the gulches? Can we look at opportunities to bring in an educational component, bring in uh, master practitioners that can help us further understand these resources and then look towards opportunities for either preservation, uh, for preservation's sake to just keep them as is, you know, kind of put a couple on them or preservation for the opportunities for adaptive reuse. Can these places become uh, places of learning, of sharing, of teaching, of revitalizing certain cultural practices and whatnot. Again, we're not, we, we are not making any of those decisions of what those activities could be in those, those zones, but we're just sharing what those opportunities are. So again, that's sort of the work we had done to date and what most of you may have seen before. Now, what about it? So I'm gonna turn the time over to Ryan and Kai and um, I can, I can I guess, you know, tell me to advance the slides for you folks. I can do that one unless you guys want to share this yourself. Yeah. You no, know, yeah, no problem. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Can you hear you? Okay. Okay. Because I apologize. Um, I'm at home and sometimes um, my uh, my internet kind of cuts in and out, and my headset also cuts in and out. I need to invest in a new headset. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Ryan Shar. I'm a civil engineer uh, with G70, a uh, partner here uh, at the company with Kavika. I've uh, been uh, uh, just honored to work on this project uh, for the community. And I know there's a lot of concerns, obviously, with um, the, a lot of the engineering components of this project. What what does erosion and, and access look like? Um, you know, how can we minimize flooding downstream of properties? How can we minimize the, the movement of sediment into uh, the environment uh, from this land? And at the same time, how can we still support uh, uh, you know, cooling on a homestead project here. And so I know the challenges are, are, are there um, in addition to the uh, significant amount of cultural and archaeological sites that Kubica has mentioned before, you know, we've, 
we've uh, at G7, I feel, have really taken this into account and tried to pr propose a lot layout here that um, is appropriate for the project area, the amount of uh, um, and potential amount of homestead lots that there could be. And um, also trying to minimize, you know, too much density onto onto this, the hillside uh, uh, by going uh, you know, far up the hill as well. So I think folks have noticed that we've really focused in on the lower half of what, you know, the total DHHL land holdings is um, in this area as, um, you know, this project has been developed. So overall, the project area is, is really kind of narrowed and widowed itself down to about 58 and a half acres. Of that, um, we've looked at a, a one acre uh, Kuliana uh, property, homestead properties, and that's something that, um, you know, I know earlier Kavika mentioned that the one acre may be too small um, for beneficiary preference, but at the same time, you know, I think it, it going bigger uh, uh, to bigger lots here also reduces the number of lots, and, and, uh, and we'll get to some discussion about this in a little bit, but uh, to be frank, you know, the less amount of lots that the department can put onto the property makes the price per lot to develop this project much higher. And so the uh, the goal really, I think, for the department is to find a sweet spot of a, a good amount of lots that's appropriate for the area, but also at the same time not, um, you know, spending a lot of money on roadway improvements and erosion control improvements and drainage improvements to so, uh, support a minimal amount of lots. So what you'll see soon is uh, a lot summary here of just 32 subsistence agricultural lots of one acre current size. Uh, that means what's left is about 11 acres of community area that um, we've identified as areas that are just more regular shaped, could be areas of higher slope, but just, um, you know, I think for the lots themselves where a Kuliana agricultural lot would be, we really want to focus in on areas where the, the lots were less than 30% slope. I think 30% is even fairly high for most. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, ideally the slopes are somewhere around. That's why, um, you know, not every area is identified for uh, uh, actual use or, or homesteading. Hmm. Right, really quick. Oh, to, um, yep. Your 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 um, I don't know if there's a speaker or your microphone. Yeah. Is a I'm gonna change. Happening. I'm gonna change my microphone because I think that happened. Is that better? Is That's that better? better? There you go. Um, yeah. 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 Um, sorry okay. about that. Um, no, 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 no. The the lot layout which we'll see in a moment here follows what is mostly the existing roadway on the west side of the there's a kind of a gulch that bisects the middle here and there you go um follows that roadway layout and, and a lot of that is really to minimize additional costs to the department but some of that also is because we know that the road is traversable uh folks have been able to drive up there with four by four vehicles it may be in a poor kind of washed out not currently well maintained condition but um at the moment, you know, that's uh, something that doesn't require the department to go in and uh, clear and, and cut in new roadways into um, the project area. So what you see here are the uh, 32 uh, one acre lots in yellow. Again, many of them follow the existing road and across both sides of the parcel, actually, uh, you know, as you come up from the water tank, make your way across the gulch um, and head back down to the cemetery. Um, that roadway loop is kind of the primary loop um, of access that has been identified for this project. A new access point would be um, proposed here at the lower portion, um, Makai area, um, as you see right there, connecting to a small um, public right of way uh, that is right off of um, the highway. So uh, that's where a secondary access point would be uh, proposed because right now folks that are, are entering the property this way are actually uh, going through private property to get onto property near the cemetery. Um, you'll see a couple of uh, kind of north-south on this plan, what really are east-west orange lines that split off of the existing road. And that's where we would identify areas to uh, access additional lots behind um, what would be the existing road that currently uh, meanders up the, the hillside. And so those would be new. Um, uh, dirt roads, really, but um, we'll get into the roadway section a little bit. Uh, ideally designed for uh, the terrain and uh, providing drainage and uh, 
opportunities to intercept runoff as it moves down the hillside um, and then move it back into the appropriate gulches uh, for, uh, on either side of, uh, of the lots. Um, there is an opportunity for some of this water to even you know, uh, be used uh, on, on each of the lots as well, if, uh, if that's something that the, uh, the Homestead Association decides to do. But that's, this is generally the lot layout. The areas in blue are the community areas. And again, as mentioned, areas that are either um, too close to the uh, Department of Water Supplies uh, Ualapui shaft, which is located just below the water tank, um, or areas with uh, more irregular shapes, as you can kind of see on the lower side there. There you go. And uh, why, uh, go ahead. No, no, I was gonna, and I was gonna quickly add too. So, you know, we mentioned, quote unquote, the project area being about 50 acres. And I, I got this as a side question. Um, you know, really the settlement plan area is about 412, but the refinement of what we're sharing in terms of um, the homestead lots, as well as the community uses is, approximately, and the roadway combined about 58 acres. Again, we'll also talk about what are the other opportunities relative to special district or stewardship lands um, with the general plan update uh, in a bit. But just want to clarify, because I, I think some people had a question um, as to the total acreage of the parcel and how much of that now we're considering for the specifics of homesteading. So really, as you can see, you know, 58 of the 412 is, is really a fraction. Thanks. And so you see um, you know, a, a large area within the center of the property untouched in Kavika, if we can go to the next slide. Um, the reason is, you know, obviously through the, the investigations and the on-field on um, site visits that were done, areas of uh, significant cultural and uh, archaeological um, significance were found in those areas. And, and at, at this point, um, I know we're only at kind of at the uh, reconnaissance level uh, of the study, but uh, you know, at this point, the, the team felt it was prudent to uh, min uh, maintain some buffers around these sites, um, potentially could be um, restored or, or um, protected and, and used and, and managed in the future, but uh, right now not areas where um, there are significant um, uh, lots uh, located in, in the area for Kuleana purposes. Um, the area, it's kind of hard to see, but you'll see a kind of a couple of semicircle yellow areas with a crosshatch. Those are areas within a thousand foot setback of two wells. One is the Wallapui shaft and the other one is a private well located further down. And that's uh, a requirement, you know, based off of the county's potential wellhead protection zone requirements, as well as um, the Department of Health's um, individual wastewater system, uh, sewer uh, system design. In, in, for septic tanks and things like that uh, need to be set back from public drinking water sources at least a thousand feet. The area in blue is um, what the county has identified as a well prepared protection zone B. Um, so it's, it is an area of concern and monitoring. It does not preclude um, the uh, use of that area for residential purposes. Um, and so that's why uh, there are lots uh, located still within the blue area, but it's something that, uh, you know, is it's, it's to be considered um, at uh, the Department of Health when applying for any type of wastewater uh, permit uh, would uh, add some, uh, some additional scrutiny to uh, uh, potential wastewater systems located on those properties. Areas located within the water protection zone, you, you do see some community use areas, and I think those have been proposed to uh, be community use areas without any sewer uh, disposal, subsurface sewer disposal, because those are within. Um, the setback of the wells, but some areas that are um, outside of that area could have um, their own sewer systems, um, albeit it is the shapes of the lots are fairly regular, but could have them, um, which could, you know, lend itself to a potential community uh, pavilion with a kitchen or something like that in the future uh, where a, a wastewater disposal system could be installed. Um, next slide, please, because I know um, we, we do have limited time. Just some renderings. I think uh, the idea here was just to show what this might look like um, from a, a, not just an aesthetic visual uh, impact, but also a slope and terrain kind of idea. You know, it, obviously this is very steep property. Um, this is modeled using publicly available um, surface information. So this is accurate, you know, relatively accurate. I know it's not down to the, the centimeter of accuracy, but it's, it's uh, fairly accurate. If we want to continue on here, um, showing from a couple of different views, but you can see how uh, the roadway is basically following the existing road, uh, but some new roads and some new lots off of those roads would be uh, would be put in. Uh, could we, yeah, continue on. 
Um, we tried to show this uh, just to visually represent it. Again, you know, with the Kulinar program, you're not required to have a home, um, but just to visually represent what a small, you know, uh, 1,500 square foot, 1,000 square foot structure might look like on property. Uh, maybe even some perimeter landscaping to assist with wind and erosion. Um, and uh, what this kind of elevation drop might look like across any individual lot, right? So if you're on an individual lot, if you put your house at the top um, and that's right off of the road, there still is a significant drop across these lots. These were you know, generally sized similar to county you know, subdivision standards. And um, you, could, you could be on an area where there may be 50 to 60 feet worth of, of drop across your lot. So it's a, it is a fairly significant um, elevation change even across one lot, but something um, we think is manageable. Um, I think, Kavika, you had these slides, or did I? <laughs> um, I, I can, so, so of course, of course um, I feel like I'm pitching to, to the choir because we learned a lot from you folks, but this is just to kind of highlight that, you know, back, uh, I don't know exactly when this was, but like Kalama Ula, Molokai, that, you know, there was a question of, okay, what can you do in one acre, right? So again, the not a necessity, but you could do something like in you know different sizes of home, but just to show like yeah, you could do a home with a mala or a specific gardening, farming, fruit trees, greenhouse, and you know even in some regards some small livestock. Um, so this is to kind of again the renderings, this layout, just to kind of start to paint a picture, hopefully in some of your minds as to what what these spaces could be. As um, as Ryan alluded to, those blue spaces. Again, we, we've heard different things. We may pause our questions tonight as to what, what, what can or should these community use spaces be like? Or again, all those purple or excuse me, pink areas with the concentric circles. I mean, again, those are sites that have been identified in a reconnaissance survey. There's still gonna be a need um, as we go through the, the longer process of, of entitlements to go through and, and look at, okay, which of these sites will, um, Will require further investigation now that we kind of have a layout which sites you know to the to the consensus of um, consultation should be preserved which ones can be studied and then utilized for other purposes and whatnot so all that being said you know our initial uh, feedback given was it, the community uses could be everything from a pavilion maybe a traditional hale as a gathering space um you know we heard the one acre wasn't enough so you know the one acre could be for your family to, to care for your family, the subsistence of your family, but you could look to doing com more community ag, making a mala or, or, or orchards to, to provide more edible resources, not just for the homesteaders, but for the broader um, Wallapu'e Mana'e community. As I mentioned, you know, we've heard things like, well, you could make, uh, the, the aina can be, can be the learning ground, the training ground of building up future stewards on both the care of environmental and cultural sites, provide on-site agricultural workshops and training. We could even do test nurseries, greenhouses for starter plants and, and seasonal crops that could be utilized both in, in the edible landscaping, but those um, plants that are good for holding back erosion that become part of sort of the natural buffer that, um, that Ryan will get back into when we talk about the roadways and, and how we will manage water. And so again, these are ideas we've heard, you know, this is really your plan. And so to get feedback, um, you know, as we continue this conversation as to, you know, is there a preference? And I guess one thing that's on here that uh, was shared in our last meeting, which didn't make our bullets, was this conversation of, of resiliency hub or a place to go basically for a sanctuary, if you will, if there's a natural hazard event, uh, a storm coming, a, a tidal wave or tsunami, excuse me, um, where the people, you know, people from the area, not just homesteaders, can retreat to wait out the, the event, um, be in a safe place. And then once done, you know, it, it's a place they can help in not just the response, but also in the recovery. Again, that was an idea that was put forth for some consideration. Um, and then going back now to some of the, well, how do we make this work? We know there's an erosion issue. We've heard this many from many folks as to concern. And I'm going to turn it back over to, to either Ryan or Kai to kind of talk, well, how can some of the engineering components, specifically the road and its maintenance, help to address some of those things? Thanks. Um, so the uh, obviously the road system currently out there is, is, is in disrepair. And I think really the goal with um, 
trying to minimize the erosion is having um, roads that are, are well-maintained, that have adequate drainage um, and move water off roads, the roadway surface. Um, and that you know, helps with preventing washout and rutting in the roads and, and that transport of sediment down on the stream. But this, because this is a steep area, you know, making sure that roadside swales do have um, the ability to slow water down, um, even uh, remove sediment as water passes through um, some of these swales, if the swales can be vegetated. Those are important ways, I think, also of, of minimizing the erosive kind of capacity of, of the fast moving water down these roads, um, while also uh, minimizing um, erosion and uh, the roads from washing out themselves. And so, you know, making sure that the roads are designed um, and, and, and can be improved to uh, handle this amount of water now coming down here is important. And I think uh, some of the, the best practices we would look at would be obviously swales with, and, and check dams and kind of see a sample here on the, the right. Um, a, a couple of uh, uh, areas, ways to move water uh, along the roads with the, this kind of cutback um, roadway section you see down here would be a, a drainage ditch, would be a, either a cross drain or a, a shallow water bar or berm that can and bring water across the road and prevent um, opportunities for a washout. Um, but I do think also, um, you know, just making sure that the land is also under um, management. If, if uh, folks are on on uh, their cooling on a property and are using it for agriculture and use some um, uh, of these stabilization best practices and surfacing and establishing you know, vegetation and stabilization when um, fields are not in use or using best practices like um, the National Resource Conservation Service may propose something like contour farming or, or what we call terrace farming. Um, that Those are also ways where water moving down. Uh, these properties can be captured, used for uh, crop uh, cultivation and also minimize the amount of eros erosion and sediment transport down um, the hill. So it's important, I think, that we point out some of these opportunities. Um, and I think uh, even from some, some, some of the uh, archaeological finds, you know, we do um, recognize that this area was used as a, a, a small garden, terrace farming garden for um, individuals here. Um, and so that's uh, something that, uh, you know, I think is good to replicate. What's shown on here are some arrows uh, in, in multiple directions, but you can see how um, runoff could be managed, um, where ditches and swales could be located above lots, preventing uh, continued movement of sediment, sed sediment down uh, to uh, the hillside, also preventing uh, water uh, to, to getting to the roads and washing out roads. Uh, this is, you know, more conceptual nature right now, but something that, um, you know, as uh, plans progress, you know, we are, are ways that uh, water would be managed. So it would not be washing out roads. I think there are opportunities, though, again, where some of this water could be uh, recaptured and used on property. Um, as well, if, uh, if that's something that uh, uh, can be done in, in the future as, as some of these roads are designed. Um, I know several of you mentioned water systems and water options and availability as something critical to this uh, project. Um, I think it's important to note that uh, you know, while uh, this area doesn't get as much rain as other areas, obviously you know, catchment systems are still possible. Um, it is, uh, I know you guys had just gone through a fairly significant rain event recently. And so, you know, obviously that's just one point in the year, but, um, you know, I think it's, it's part of a system of, of, of opportunities to bring water uh, to your, pro to those properties. Um, obviously there's a, a opportunities to bring water in or use atmospheric water generators if the, if the humidity is high enough, but um, we'd also look at, um, like I said, road runoff harvesting, somehow being able to um, collect, um, um, water from some of these swales and then there you know there could be an opportunity for some of these communities is if the if the area is further in Malka where a, a community or joint catchment system might be a possibility for the you know the, the homesteaders uh, which could be stored in a tank as, as you see here on the right um, and then distributed or or, or distributed or, or taken by uh, the lessees here um, those are different options. Uh, if you can, there's another slide here, and the department is still studying the next options here is obviously trying to connect to the, the county source. Um, haven't had a chance myself to, to dig into the, uh, the draft water um, 
a development uh, plan from the county. Uh, but I know that um, Andrew and team have, have requested water from the county to be increased allocation to this area. So it is possible that a, a, a spigot in the future may be able to be used. Um, for uh, other concepts here are spigots at Kalama Ula. Um, you know, that is off of the DHHL system, but is quite a bit away. And, and I think um, folks, you know, in the department and, 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 and want to make sure that water is reserved for uh, all users on Molokai. So not uh, trying to take water from one area and move it to the other, but it's something that um, the team was asked to consider. Um, again, I mentioned water catchment at higher um, elevations, and, and, I, and we have heard from the community that there is a stream diversion um, there was, there is, or maybe a stream diversion further in Malka uh, that's blocking water coming down the center of the uh, project area and investigating whether or not some of that diversion could be uh, tapped or utilized for this project. Uh, but I think it's important, I think, just to move off the water as we move off the water conversation is just, uh, you heard Kavika speak to what's really required at the end of the day by uh, DHL as part of his Kuliana program and water is not necessarily one part of it, but we know how important it is to making sure that the community is successful. Um, potential wastewater options, some of you have mentioned this being important, you know, individual wastewater systems will be proposed. The lot, the lot count here is, is less than the kind of that 50 threshold that uh, DOH, Department of Health, looks at um, for uh, wastewater treatment work. So um, individual wastewater systems would be work, uh, would be here, but some of that due diligence would need to be done by the lessees once uh, lots are awarded. Um, using composting toilets, gray water reuse, so recapturing uh, water from showers, your laundry, your sinks, and recirculating them into um, uh, your wastewater toilets, flushing um, are also possible, um, or using it also for irrigation. So uh, these are just some examples, but um, um, again, as long as outside of that 1,000 foot setback, um, an individual wastewater system should be permittable by the Department of Health. Um, moving on, could we can next slide? I think that sums up my, um, my section on the infrastructure, uh, but I, it is important uh, to note that um, the, again, just similar to the water, the wastewater is something that is, uh, is something that is going to be a, a lessee responsibility at the end of the day, and, and that's something that's uh, part of the Kuniana um, program uh, as, as not a, a requirement for the DHL. And, and a lot of this, I, I guess all I'm saying is just because cost is important and, and to the department as well, making sure that um, it's being, the funds are, are, are well spent and uh, uh, the Kuniana program is intended to reduce the initial outlay capital costs of developing lots and so uh, that's that is part of the department's goals in, in this project as well. Yeah. So thanks. So, so Ryan, thanks. But I'm not gonna ask you can we quickly. So so we do have a we do have a Zoom poll based on what we shared, but I also want to not um I would be remiss not to mention that there are some questions or comments in the chat which uh, I'm trying to pull up now. So I guess uh, a comment here from Lori Buchanan where where the residential lots are proposed there is uh, quote unquote hard pan, similar to several sites of Kahoalabe, West Molokai, and other areas throughout the state. Hard pan is very degraded and not suitable for farming. Restoration efforts to mitigate hard pan is extremely labor intensive, extremely costly, and will take a very long time to mitigate and restore. To date, millions of dollars have been spent on hard pan mitigation on Kahoalabe with very with little success. Same patterns and conceptual plans were used in Cavella Plantation Subdivision and failed to perform as planned. And the result is tons of silt until the fringing reef in Cavella, just sharing. And then the last comment, at least here thus far, there is no gray water reuse approved by DOH. So um, I don't know, Ryan, if you're able at this time to kind of either acknowledge sure, yeah. it or speak, speak to some other think... comments, but yeah. Please. Yeah, I think to the, the hard pan question, I mean, I think it, it would be good to know, um, you know, if this is something that uh, is over all the, all the uh, areas that the residential lots were proposed, some of them or whatnot. Um, I do feel like that, you know, this is subsistence ag farming. So, you, you know, there's going to be some level of kind of restoration needed. Um, but it's also kind of as the 
lessees are able to manage the land. It could be used for just homesteading, you know, could be used for subsistence ag multiple ways. Um, I, I mean, obviously, I, I, I've been to Coal Lobby and understand the kind of the issues there. Um, I think that this area would support crops based off of kind of what we've seen in the field. Um, but I think you know, the condition, the, the, the soil characteristics are something that uh, uh, is, uh, is something that, uh, unfortunately, I think right now, at least the, the department is saying that, um, you know, to, to come up with a farm plan would be the, the responsibility of the, the lessees. Right. Uh, and I, and I, and I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, I think, Andrew, please. No, I, I think to um, Laurie's point, I think looking at the soils is something that we can um, consider as we move forward in this in this process. We, we definitely want to make sure that um, we we um, put our beneficiaries in a in a good position to be successful. So looking at the soils, I think, is a a good thing to um, re-examine. Olale, olale. Okay, so and, so and regarding the the last two, I mean, I, I think I I understand you know the same patterns and except for plans. I, I think it's the performance. Um, you know, ideally is is measured also by maintenance, and so I, I'd be curious to know if, if the Covella plantations um, design was actually implemented and and, and maintained during, throughout the life of the project. And um, we can definitely look at that as well. And and I do understand you know, gray water use is formally approved by Department of Health. Um, I do I do think that it that'll be changed as we move forward um, as the Department of Health looks to um, update its rules. So something we want to consider um, as a potential option in the future. Sorry, and one, one, and one more thing is I think as we um, look at the historic sites, I think those also give us um, information about the potential of, of the area, mm -hmm. um, the, depending on what type of sites there are. Um, we know there are, are a lot of sites, so there was a lot of activity by Native Hawaiians in the area in the past. So I think looking at what those sites were and mm -hmm. seeing what the potential could be um, is also a good uh, indicator of what types of uses might be useful, I mean, successful or not successful going forward. Uh, absolutely, and, 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 and really want to thank Lori and others for these kinds of good questions because it continues to um, uh, invoke, you know, our, our our thinking process and okay, we gotta look at this and consider this. So I think we all, all we all can agree too that, you know, some of this is not going to be solved overnight or upon a award. Like you can start to plan. It's an as is, and, and there's some historical legacy to those lands, both think in a good way, but also in a challenging way. And, and yes, and I'm trying to look for models of quote unquote failure that we can learn from, but also other models of success out there too. And, and you know, we will continue to sort of pursue that. And if people have thoughts and recommendations on also the, the things they've seen work in very arduous conditions. I mean, I know Kaholave has some challenges, but I've also been been blessed to have been there a couple of times and, and seen some really awesome, amazing restoration happening you know, at, a, at a limited scale, but some of it happening. Um, anyway, to be continued. So, so that being said, I now again, time for a Zoom poll. Uh, this is the second one. And we have, uh, in this case, about six questions, um, which, at least on my screen, looks like they're all coming up at once. I'm, I'm presuming that that's the same for everyone here. So I'll, I'll go through the questions. And again, this you can take your time to go through them. So based upon what we shared, you know, again, we're showing these one-acre lots. What do you think of the initial lot size? Is it too large, too small, or perfect size? What do you envision for the community space uses? Again, we threw some ideas um, up there uh, based upon what we've heard in past conversations, communal garden spaces, maybe an open pavilion with composting toilets, composting areas, uh, nursery or, or, or other. Third question, and again, I apologize, I don't mean to be going quickly here, but do, do wanna kind of you know, cite off the site, the questions and the responses and it'll give you folks some time to to sort of uh, Miko and consider the answers. How should cultural and ar archaeological areas and sites be cared for? Uh, you know, we're looking at options, you know, both interim and long-term fenced for preservation and protection, restored for education and reuse, allowed to remain in current condition 
as is, which is quote unquote the least cost. Um, I think you have a single choice, but again, if if you're also not no pun intended on the fence and say, well, you know, I, I can see the value of fencing some areas, but I want to see it restored. I don't think we can we give you the option in the poll. So maybe also in the chat or when we get into more Q and A to kind of um, share you not all about about these sites would be very helpful. Question number four: um, Should the community have access, quote unquote, control over the gates? And the answers are, sorry, my, I got to go to my, open this up a little bit. Yes, gates and entries to the community will, with approved access. So this is the broader community, I believe, not just homesteaders. Uh, no, it is land open to all homesteaders. Wait, should the community have access control over gates? No, it is land open to all homesteaders and community. Yes, but gates should be open at all times and closed only when needed. Would four by four vehicle access to the site be acceptable to you or is a graded paved access road preferred? And this is what we're talking about in terms of the rules, in terms of some of the erosion things that, that Ryan was talking about. Um, again, these are, these are long answers, which I'm not seeing the full answer here myself. I can drive an off-road vehicle and deal with roads that may be washed out or in disrepair until the homestead community fixes the roads. Or, I can drive an off-road vehicle and deal with roads that may be washed out or in disrepair, but only for a day or two. Uh, third option, I need drivable access at all times using a standard vehicle or a non-off-road vehicle. Emergency vehicle access is also critical for me, whether that's for an emergency ambulance or, or fire. And then the last question, does the provision of access to pipe water, piped water, excuse me, either to fill tanks or to each lot define this project? Does that need to be a part of this project? And the options here, again, single choice. Yes, a storage tank fed by, preferably by the Department of Water Supply and supply to the lot. Uh, yes to a spigot in Walapu'e. Yes to a spigot in Kalama'ula. Or no, I will provide my own water. So again, yeah, six questions. We'll kind of leave these open um, maybe for another minute and a half. Humbly, I cannot participate in a one-sided poll, Mahalo. Uh, Cora, I couldn't get to the other questions. I could only answer questions one, two, and three. Ooh, okay. And there is a scroll, so I guess maybe to, to Cora's question, hopefully there's a scroll option on the side um, that allows you to move down the questions. And then Lori, can you add the option of none of the above to every poll question? This poll is not helpful for me to provide feedback. Thank you. Um, so noted, Lori. Um, appreciate that comment and Manao. Um, I don't think we can do that in the live poll right now. I think also your, your comment will be noted as part of the, um, what, what am I trying to say? Will be, will, will be noted as part of the influence on, on the question themselves. So we can we can, not, we can't do that now, but we can probably do that afterwards. Can you resend the poll questions again? I don't know, that's a, I'm gonna lean on my Zoom experts here, Barb or PE. If we end the poll and we restart it, are we double counting? Uh, if we end the poll and restart, it'll delete everybody's answers and restart. Okay. If we rest okay. Gotcha. Yeah. What we can do is maybe provide the questions as we send out the um, recording. Um, P. Kavika, I think if, if you've closed the poll questions if you are, and are on Zoom and you go to the Zoom controls at the bottom, there should be a polls button. Mm -hmm. If you press that, it'll pop the questions back up if you haven't answered them. So let me be is the that, guinea pig. Uh, yeah, that I'll close mine. I'll click on my <laughs> So when I do it, yeah, it works. So in, in my presentation mode, I close this, I click on the polls. I'm not participating, obviously, but I can, at least I can scroll back and forth on the questions. I don't know, maybe Cora, um, since I'm, I see, I see it appears that this this is a, an issue for you. Can you try that and just let us know, you know, in the chat or come off mute to let us know if it works for you. And uh, acknowledging, mahalo, Lori, for your acknowledgement. Yeah, we'll, we'll We'll do our best there to factor that into our final counts. Okay. Oh, I see the. Okay. Well, I I'm totally out of the poll. So 
I okay. see at the very bottom it says poll. So let me see if this would work. Yeah, so if you click that on, crossing okay. fingers, you should get back into that. Okay, so I'm in it, but it doesn't want to scroll down for me to maybe if I open it wider. Let me see if I open it wider. Nick. Okay, got it, got it. I solved my problem. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, for me too, I was like, I couldn't read the whole sentence. So yeah, so if you're on a computer, you may have to, you know, again, you, can, you got to enlarge it. You have to yeah. go. Okay, so let me go ahead and finish. Not. Okay, thank you. Let me uh, let me turn off my. Can you mute me? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and I know I know these are a lot of questions, and we're we're trying to um, you know get through a lot of information. And again, all this information, the presentation will be online. Um, there's still means to to send us manao. I mean, the conversation. How we can continue to have that. To see this evening for the remainder of our time together. Um, there is a project email that we will continue to share out. You email, if you remember that one email, it goes out to like eight of us. Um, we get all we, you know, all of us at Group 70 get it. We can share we share it with DHHL and then you know we can we actually take all that feedback into our consideration. At the time, then we also are and we'll show this in terms of preparing um, a draft document which when presented, one, it'll go back to a community meeting, which we'll get to the next steps. Um, and then from that, and why we can correct me if I'm mistaken, but I think at that point in time, when we share it, it will, it will undergo quote unquote a 30 day review where all of this information, uh, further analysis, response to some of the questions and considerations even this evening will try to be addressed there. And I think there's a 30 day public review period where people can, can Tell us what they like, what they still think is problematic. This is great, but did you look at this, this, and this, and whatnot? Yes, that's Question. correct. What is meant, I'm seeing Pat's question, what is meant by number four community access? So I think this was, and again, maybe Barb or PE, I know you guys were working on these questions, but as I understand it, it was the question or what we've heard in community, like if we're gonna do a Hawaiian homestead community, one, there are folks that are, utilize the area for things like hunting access to get up Malka, or um, I understand some folks still may pull up for gathering certain kind of la'au or, or what have you. And so I guess the question was, you know, yeah, should there be gates? I mean. What's the control of the access? Is it just for homesteaders? Is it for community? Is it for everyone all the time? Or should it be open at certain times, but um, but uh, closed only when needed, that kind of thing? Yeah, that, sorry, that was uh, what I had intended for the question, thanks. Okay. And then I see uh, Mahina's question, Allah Mahina, what is the budget for this project? Um, in terms of planning budget, development budget, maybe you can help me understand um, what specifically you're interested in. Yeah, I'm just curious what funding um, budget DHHL has allocated hmm. um, for this project so far. Um, Kavika, correct me if I'm wrong, but the um, the contract that we have for the planning and environmental assessment um, was about um, four hundred thousand. Correct. Thank you. And is there a projected anticipated cost to end of to end of project and you know allocation? Only up to the end of the planning process. Um, through the planning process, we'll have a better idea of what the projected cost would be moving forward um, in the design work and also uh, potential construction okay. of, of the roadways and improvements. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, you know. um, um, okay, so. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, GG, Andrew. DHHL planning office. Uh, just to add to what Andrew said, um, for design and construction costs, when we get to that point, uh, the department will need to find uh, funds 
for those costs. Um, you know, it, it, it's uh, currently, you know, it is not, uh, there is no budget right now to pay for those costs. Um, so first thing is we gotta determine what those costs are. And then secondly, we have to go out and uh, find uh, funding for it. So just, just, you know, kind of some next steps further Thank down the road. Thank you, Gigi. Okay. Um... So I, we're, we're going to still open up for more questions. I, what, I, what I'd like to do, PE, if you can maybe close the poll, and then we can quickly go through the um, responses. OK. So what do you think of the initial lot size? And again, you know, we're being re realistic. Uh, I think there's 21 people on here. We have about six respondents on these. So mahalo to the six. And again, we're not suggesting that that the answers of the six are going to drive everything, but we're going to take all that into account and other comments and whatnot. So initial lot size, I mean, at least, at least those that were able to participate um, felt that at least the one acre um, is a good size, perfect size. The vision for the community use spaces, um, you know, they like, looks like the um, you know, half resilience area with an open pavilion with composting toilets, uh, with consideration for other possible spaces, how should archaeological sites be cared for, restored for education and reuse, uh, at least half, and then allowed to remain as is. And so I, again, you know, it, it feels like there's a tendency or a trend, but you know, the Manao is also still varied. And, and again, that's good for us to know that, okay, well, either we need to have more conversations um, about that and or just be open to the fact that some of these things may um, be works in progress as I think the you know, different tiers of community, whether it's the beneficiaries or the broader community, want to engage in so a conversation like this about okay, how do we um, look to the opportunity of the care of the Mo'omehu that's left by our people in, the, in these areas? Should the community have access control, i.e., gates? Um, no, it is land. So, so no, so no to access control and gates, it is land open to all homesteaders and community. That seems to resonate. Um, that's more than a, a trend. That uh, seems to be a preference at least for the six participants. Uh, would four by four access to be acceptable? Again, the response here, I can drive an off-road vehicle and deal with roads that may be washed out and or disrepair, but only for a day or two, about half. And again, split to a preference of, yeah, I can just access anytime or I prefer drivable road with emergency access so so noted and then in terms of the water options does the provision of access to pipe water either to fill tanks or to each lot define this project uh these here four of the six respondents yes the spigot in Wallapule seems to be the preference with a split on a storage tank to be fed by department of water supply or provision of well, providing for my own water so mahalo to those that participated um Again, this gives, gives us a snapshot. It's not definitive. And I'm gonna keep this going. So next steps, um, I don't think I have too many slides left here. So again, tonight, this was the this was our third beneficiary meeting in the series to share what we did this evening. Um, what we're hoping for is as we take in this feedback and we, again, look at, look at a couple more things in terms of the questions being asked this evening and going back to those first slides about what a settlement plan needs to include, where we are not going to be in the drafting of a, of a draft plan. And in coming out, we are saying early 2023, we really don't have a, a perfect timetable to that. Um, but again, as we get closer to it, the intention is as we get a draft, we share it with the broader community, kind of go through that and probably looking to do that in person. Um, and then that will open up in a formal 30-day public review period. We take feedback from that, and then we look to complete that homestead plan. Again, in terms of the overall process, if you will, um, that's not the that's not the end of this work. Um, this would then probably take us into the environmental analysis phase or the assessment phase, which we'll go through. For those again familiar with the environmental review process, we go through that, which is a part of like another nine months of. Uh, well, we have all this. We have most of the studies we need. But um, there might be a need for additional information, data gathering, and we produce the environmental assessment. It goes through its own review. And ultimately, what will end up having to happen is at the end of all that, the Hawaiian Homes Commission will be, will be presented both with the settlement plan 
and and the draft EA and then take into consideration all those comments to make a final decision uh, relative to its approval. Um, I'll pause there to see maybe if anyone else from the planning team or Andrew, Gigi, want to add anything to that in terms of where we're headed in the next um, the next few months. Okay, seeing none, but a little more. Oh, yeah, Andrew, I, I didn't have any, I, I didn't have anything else. So I mean, so just just wanted to emphasize that what Kavika just outlined though takes us to the end of the planning phase, um, but. In order for the department to actually get to um, Homestead Lot Awards, there are um, a couple more um, processes uh, we have to go through. We have to, um, like, as Gigi mentioned, um, get budget um, for improvements. We have to do uh, meets and bounds surveys uh, for the actual lots. And then once we do that, um, and once we make the necessary improvements uh, to make the um, proposed settlement uh, um, accessible by road, um, then we then and then we could start to consider um, offering homestead awards. Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, and I think we have our last poll. Um, oh, Kavika, I'm there's sorry. one more. Oh, I'm in sorry. I missed, did, I miss, did I miss something in the chat? Um, thank you. Andrew. One more. Oh, and the 400, the 400 K budget covers all of that for the future. Can we have a better schematic of the process? Um, sure, Laurie. I, I think we actually in previous meetings have shared, well, at least, um, went through the planning process. Absolutely. You know, we have details of that. And I think the longer process of, okay, where do we go from here towards implementation? I think maybe for our next upcoming meeting, we can ref refine, um, we find that in a way that's you know, digestible because again, it's it is complicated um, as to where we go from here. In terms of the 400k budget, um, it does cover the work that we've been assigned to do relative to developing the settlement plan, all of our consultant team members, and then pre preparing of the EA and going through that EA review process. Uh, that is that is that is uh, correct. That's what's covered. It's not to cover anything beyond that towards um, implementation and those kinds of things. And, and you're welcome. Yeah, I'll leave it here. Okay, so last last Zoom poll. Um, we have final four questions um, for the evening, and this was kind of, I mean, speaking a little bit to implementation. Um, right, the the sentiment is this: some people are going to be ma'a to this way of living. Uh, some people are going, you know, might need some help or the collective of how do we work as a community. So, um, what we're aware of, there's ongoing opportunities in other spaces and places where there's tra training involved. So one of the questions we want to ask was, well, you know, training could be potentially offered um, to prepare families, you know, even before, well, with the award, but in leading to the actually settlement onto the land to prepare for this off-grid lifestyle. And as, as a beneficiary, one, would you be interested in any of the following um, things like site development, erosion control, farming techniques, native plant restoration, cultural site restoration and or reuse, home construction, off-grid utilities, emergency preparedness inclusive of but not limited to wildfire prevention and potential vendors. I might need some help from someone else on the potential vendors. What was the model behind that? From the group 17. Yes, those are just um, those people that could help with, say, potential home construction or um, other uh, opportunities for um, engagement and learning, uh, educational learning. Gotcha. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so that's the first, and again, that's a lot of information, and you may not even have, like, I'm not sure, or someone, yeah, like, it's like one person said, yeah, all of it. <laughs> so, um but if some people have a specific interest more than others, we'll still kind of post that. Do you feel the community has the resources, abilities, and means to provide long-term maintenance and repair of roadways? As, as you know, recall, one of the uh, conditions there in with the rules is that the uh, LSE will participate not just in the care of their own lot, but the provision of, of being part of the community to provide the long-term maintenance and repair to roadways. Um, so again, I'm sorry to see some people chime in, yes, 
uh, no, yes, but we need some support from Dean Chicho. The third question here, would you be willing to wait for the provision of water or a paved road if it meant it would take DHHL longer to award the land? And again, the answers are yes, no, unsure. And if offered, would you yourself as, as a beneficiary, would you accept a one acre Kuleana homestead lot as laid out in what we shared tonight for the Wallapue Kuleana homestead project? Again, this is not, you know, we, we, we don't track who's participating. I don't, I don't know who's answering these questions. You know, we, we, we're just taking it from the fact that you're here this evening. And just getting a sense, like, does this feel good? Does this look good from a certain perspective? Again, recognizing we still gotta go through that environmental review. And I know some of you folks this evening may have uh, more questions. Um, uh, one, number one question for round three poll is, wow, you should always have a block for suggestions. So, so noted, it is wow. Um, and always can look to improve. I believe the beneficiaries will need to advocate for funds to be budgeted by DHHL. Um, so nice presentation was well done. Thank you. Well, mahalo, Cora. And mahalo to everyone just being part of this discussion. And, you know, really, uh, the, we can keep this poll open um, for a bit. But in terms of the, of the presentation, um, really, that was essentially it uh, on our side. We definitely, with the time remaining, I know it's approaching 7.30. I think our meeting was supposed to only go to 7.30. Uh, we want to respect folks' time. But we can be available to still kind of answer some questions. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to try to do two things at once. I see Mahina's question. For some of these questions, I think you would need to ask the actual awardees like for question two. Fair enough. You know, I, I think the some of the participants this evening, uh, I, again, I forget the exact numbers, but I think we extended it out to it. A fair, a fair large number of those that are actually on the waiting list for ag lands on Molokai. Again, this is just sort of sort of pulsing. You know, we're not going to use the findings as sort of the definitive justification for anything, but to give it a, a fair shake as to what's being represented and those that are participating. Um, it helps us just kind of think about are we sort of on track or are we kind of straying on something. So that being said, um, you know, with the time we have left, and I know with this group. We, we, I think some of us have um, alignment in, in thought, some of us have difference of opinion. I think for the most part, we've always been courteous and showing aloha to one another, even if we don't always agree. Um, you know, we were trying to set some ground rules, but we, again, we, I think as long as people have questions, we can make ourselves available. And um, you know, really at this time, I wanted to put this slide up, but we can get into some conversations. We can come back to the poll to close it off. But again, that Uwalapu'e Kuleana at g70.design as well as the dhho.planning at hawaii.gov. Those are two primary ways you can contact us if you send it to the Wallapui Poliana G70 design. Again, that will go to our entire G70 staff of engineers and planners. And then again, for more information, you can go to the dhho.hawaii.gov um, slash PO slash Mokai to get to our information website. And um, yeah, so we can just open up the conversation. I guess, Pete, do you wanna, you know, should bring back the poll here. And can we close the poll, share results? So it just looks like, yeah, the, the wild question, I mean, there's a lot to digest and it looks like there's an interest virtually into everything. Um, do you feel the community has the resources, the ability and means to provide the long-term assistance? Um, looks like, you know, uh, the fair majority of participants, at least this, Quick poll, yes, but would need support. Would you be willing to wait for the provision? There seems to be a preference not to wait for the provision of water or paved road. And if offered, would you accept it? These five of the six uh, have answered yes. So it's, it's just a pulse. It's not the final answer. Um, team members, whether from DHHL or, or Group 70, any final thoughts or questions? And I'm trying to look through the chat or Anyone else from the from the community? You know, again, don't have to be true chat. You can also take yourself off mute or small enough group. Um, you can try and answer more questions. Uh, Kavika, this is Barb. Uh, I just had a question. Was there a phase slide after the um, arrow timeline? Um, I think it fleshed out a little bit more information of how this uh, project goes from beginning to end. I don't know if that accidentally got taken out.
Pardon me, I was on mute. Um, it's not in my deck currently. So I'll just say though, that's maybe we can please consider not doing preset polling. So noted. Is you know, we're just trying to find ways to to gather uh gather perspectives and whatnot. I I I hear you, Laurie. Um, and to Barb, yes, I think what we probably want to do is we can uh, work with our and I our think client. Too. Yeah, to, to Laurie's suggestion. Yeah, to Laurie's suggestion earlier, I think, yeah, we can have a diagram of um the overall process. Um when and we'll we'll work to to have that um during the next uh, meeting. And and just wanted to point out the the next one, the next meeting that we have in the planning process is a uh, community meeting. Um it's not a beneficiary consultation meeting. So um that one, as Kabika had mentioned, will be um early next year um, so so we will um, invite the larger community um, the East End community to that meeting um, that's what we intend to do mm -hmm. is to meet in person yeah of oh, course I see your hand up a virtual hand up Hi, I, I actually just had a statement um, back in October of 21, I think, when I first met G70, there was another group that um, they focus on fire prevention. I would be interested to hear their plan um, or, you know, if it's in your folks report, I would really um, would like to see what they suggested and also the terraces that um, I think I think Andrew had mentioned. I would really be interested in the location of where these possibilities are. These terraces. Um, anyway, those were those were the two areas that I would be interested in. Thank you. Thank you, Cora. Yeah. So, so we one of our team members is the Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization, which is a nonprofit group, and even though they're based in in well, I know it's Hawaii Island. I think they're in Kona, technically, but they actually provide uh, um, fire science services, uh, both in gathering data, reviewing when wildfires happen, you know, analyzing the spread, coming up with educational curriculum for different communities to make them resilient. Um, they are they have been part of our conversation, and we do have a small wildfire sort of report section that's being compiled. And yeah, we can definitely share those findings um, with with you and with everyone else. As to what they're sharing, and then the terraces. If you're talking about the sort of the terraces relative to the roads, I think that was Ryan. But also we we're we we're talking, I think, a little bit on the archaeology that you know some of the traditional sites that we've identified at least at a preliminary level. And the report will tell us more details um, that we we think there are traditional ag sites um, that are still intact. And so I guess the question would, would be: Would these be opportunities to do more community-based? Um, Restoration, not just from a cultural perspective, but to actually put some of these um, potential ag sites back into into cultivation. Um, in my in my short stint, I, I had a short life at Kamehameha Schools, and we were back in um, uh, the Homo Valley behind Lahaina. So it's a quick story, and this area for many many years was untouched. And long story short, we did we did the clearing, and just doing the clearing of um, these ag terraces, it, re it revitalized the land and I kid you not, like, like plants that had not had been identified, like either the seeds were dormant and they came back to life, but there was a vitality that came back to the land. So the long story short, yeah, we, we can look at those opportunities and share that information once we have the, um, the, the, the data um, in, in a report form. That was my purpose of asking was for ag purposes. And then yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other one regarding the wildfire, I was interested in the type of plants that they would suggest. Um, I know they use bananas, but I want to know if there were other plants that they looked at. Thank you. No problem, no problem. Um, Yolanda, I see your hand up and we wait patiently. Mahalo, um, can take yourself off mute and ask your question. Or not yes. Um, my my question is is for the second poll number four um mm -hmm. you talked about the fences and it stated that um it should be open i guess mm -hmm. to everyone uh 
you know, yeah. to be honest with you, um, and to everyone here, if I do get awarded, I will put up a fence. And the reason is, it is for safety reasons, okay? Because I don't wanna have any bad feelings with any of my neighbors. For instance, if they're gonna plant their pakololo, whatever, that's their business. But at the same time, I don't wanna be in their yard and be accused of taking their stuff. Or mm -hmm. they come into my house and taking my tools or taking the gas out of my tank, a gas tank, you know? Because these are all the stuff that I learned while I'm here in Holy Hua, okay? And, and mind you, this happens all over the place, okay? I'm just saying for me as, as a person who's been there, done that, and also the, the safety reason, really seriously, was because we had an autistic child, hmm. okay? So we had to make sure that she was safe, yeah? And all this time we was protecting her, not knowing that people were stealing, people were um, taking things from their homes. Um, my next door neighbor, hello, the so Sri Philippines tank the other day and the thing got no more gas. And I'm mm. like, ooh, you know. But, but, but the other thing too, seriously, yeah? For me as a parent and for those that um, are parents and, and grandparents, uh, my safety is for my family. I wanna make sure that they are safe. When my gate is locked, and let me tell you, it is locked by a master lock, okay? I don't open the gate unless I know if it's family and if it's a stranger, brah, the gate going to be locked and you and me going to be talking about a fence. And I have a chain link fence right around my property, okay? My house is in the middle. My, my, my fence is all on, and it's in my property. Mm -hmm, you can mm -hmm. see it, yeah? But for safety reason, seriously, and if I have grandchildren, that's also a safety issue because I don't want them running around and going into somebody's property or pulling their plants. You know, I, I, I don't need that. I don't need that kind of stress. But at the same time, I wanna make sure that my property is safe in case I have a grandparent or an auntie that is old that, you know, I leave home to go to the store, I come back. I don't want anybody to, you know, scare her or threaten her. You see, in our days right now, yeah, we get all kinds of troubles. We get gun shooting, all this kind of stuff. Mm. I understand that. But you see, the other thing too I worry about is that when we put up the plants, you got to worry about the deers or the pigs coming mm -hmm. your property, you know? Mm -hmm. And then for us, do we have a right to shoot them? I mean, seriously, do we have a right to shoot it? You know? So that's, a, that's a good question. Those are good questions. And Yeah, and so these are the things that we need to bring up. I mean, even if... And then, like I said, in the community meeting, even if I don't get the property, I only hope for the best for everybody else. But the thing about it is this, if you don't, don't take care of your property and know your neighbors around you, mm -hmm. you problems, mm -hmm. okay? I right. just saying. I think, I think we okay. totally agree with that. Yeah, no, no, and, and, and mahalo, Yolanda, for sharing those Thank thoughts, you. right? What, what I hear resonate is, you know, for you, the, the, the the care and security, uh, the well-being of your specific ohana is important. And, and to what you just said, your last statement, I think was very, very powerful where, right, it's going to take the formation of this community, the assembly of, of those that would, that would look to seeing this award as something for them and building sort of that, that build relationship first, right? Build relationship to each other, to the aina, and that out of that, like the specifics to um, what this place looks like and feel like. I, I, I do think to just for some little bit of clarity, I think the question we were posing was we we understand or we've come to understand, and whether I understand it's 100 percent correct or not, is that right now on those some of those existing roads, there are some folks um, that utilize that area um, and that ahupa to get up to go hunting, for example, that's in the DLNR lands outside of the HHL. And as we understand it, uh, because some of the other lands are landlocked because they're privately owned that this is the only way to get up there. So more, more for the main roads and not necessarily for the individual lots, would there be a desire to have a, a gate you know, as, as part of the community? And then is there a, a need to then 
work with those that would want to see access for hunting purposes. And, and I think what we heard was there was a desire to, to, to um, ensure that the community folks that are using or utilizing the Aina now as Kupa Aina to the place will continue to have that access, especially for subsistence gathering and hunting purposes. But, um, you know, I do want to recognize and, and, and honor the, the, the concern and question. And I think I definitely, you know, we want to, we don't want to be blind to the fact that there, you know, there's some challenges within all of our communities um, because of X and Y reasons and, and how we fortify ourselves to that is kind of working together. And, and so I appreciate the heart and spirit you, you spoke to and, and we'll take that too hard as we work on our plan. So thank you. Um, and Pat, yes. Uh, yeah. On point. Yeah. It was, that was, that was, that was a good one. I'll share. Um, again, 741, I, I, we're past our, our set time. And again, I'm always trying to be respectful. We have, you know, all of us, especially you folks have places to be, people to be with, with Ohana on a mid, on a, on a mid week. So, um, but again, we're here to, to, to answer any more questions, but if I don't see anything, then maybe this is also uh, an opportune time for now to, to close things up. Okay. Um, if that's been the case, uh, anyone wanna uh, look to anyone to offer a pulley to, as we go our separate ways? Anybody would like to volunteer? Okay. If that's okay, uh, then I'd like to, oh, go ahead. Well, I was gonna ask Auntie Ivalani. Oh, please, please, Auntie please. Auntie Ivalani, our kupuna, if she'd be willing to do it. If she's still on, I don't know if she's still on. I think she is. Auntie Ivalani, would you give the closing um, tonight? I don't know if she can hear me, yeah. I don't know. I, I see her name on. Okay, well. Okay. okay well, I'll volunteer. Maha. Mahalo. Mahalo for the opportunity, Kavika. Aloha kiaku. Mahalo, mahalo, mahalo for this time. Thank you, Lord, for just our mana'o, Lord, in sharing and kuka kuka this situation in the development of Ualupu'e. Um, Lord, as we depart from our meeting, may, um, may all those that participated, may you bless them, Lord, and may you also give those that continue to um, work on this project, the strength and um, and whatever it Please is. Please no, Auntie Bolani can do. Okay, mahalo. Okay, I, I call him my Auntie Ivalani Sujita Kupuna. I'll stop here. You can go ahead and pull it. Mahalo. Go ahead, Auntie Ivalani. Oh. She may have to come off. Um, yeah, she, she's here. Go ahead, and Aloha, no. Aloha. Aloha. Lord, we thank you for this time and for the meeting of gathering of all our people. We pray thee, O oh Lord, that thou continue to give us your wisdom, revelation, knowledge from above, and understanding of the truth. Help us, Lord, that we will come together in agreement in all matters that, are, that will be helping our families, Lord, especially for our future generation, in which myself as a kupuna is so concerned about. But especially, Lord, that we have the spirit of aloha within each of us, that the spirit of aloha that, that, that stirs within our hearts, Lord. Uh, although we see so many changes that are happening, Lord, but we, we pray that that will continue and instill in us the, your love, which is the truth of all understanding. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you for all those that have come on board and all those that have shared. And we lift up all our leaders, Lord, that are here in, in cocooning for this plan. And we commit ourselves and we commit every family member all in agreement and thanking you. And we love you, Lord, and we come in agreement and we say, Amen. Thank you. Mahalo, Thank you, Auntie Malani. Mahalo, everyone. Mahalo. Blessings, blessings to everyone tonight. Thank you for being here. Uh, if you're traveling, safe travels back to your hale, to your ohana. And until such time, we can meet again. Mahalo, Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.